<laughs> hey, what's up, guys? This is a little bit different. I'm going to do an interview with Courtney from Greywood Mama blog, the blog Greywood Mama. And um, so I'm doing this interview, and Courtney, if you like, you can record yourself asking the questions. I'll, I'll ask the questions that you've written here. Uh, but if you want to be spliced into the interview, that could be done too. So right now I'm going to post this on the back end of my YouTube channel. I'll send you a link and uh, you can let me know what you think. So let's go ahead and get started. There's only five questions here, so it should be pretty easy. Um, the first one is, when you bought the property, the barn was already there. Did you hire help or do the renovation yourself? What specifically did you do and how long did it take? So we bought the house in 1987 and I remember that because my wife was pregnant with my first son, Jack. And we bought it in the spring and I think I waited a year maybe. Uh, I think I waited till maybe uh, 1998 and we started the renovation I think in June. Uh, maybe, maybe, um, uh, May because it was kind of nice out. It was nice working weather and I did the renovation with the help of my cousin Tom Goodwin who is a professional carpenter and he works in construction to this day construction management and my good friend Matt Jacobs who worked for me for a few years. He was great and uh, great memories working with Matt. So the first step in the renovating the barn was to remove the whole upper half are the whole first floor. And the way we did that was we took an uh, inch and a quarter solid steel bar and we welded, um, I think it was uh, one inch bar on top of the inch and a quarter bar. So it was just this really heavy bar with a ramrod up top. We called it the, con the convincer. We had two of them. And uh, Matt and I demolitioned the, the second floor. We were basically prepping everything so when Tom got here we were ready to roll because he was really the brains behind it. And uh, so we, we took the whole second story off, we took the front wall off, and I think we took uh, maybe this side had a lot of rot here, uh, or, or most of that corner. We kept the doorway. And so we, we removed all that. And then we had to jack up the back wall and this wall and put a new block foundation in it. Uh, so we had to dig that down. The way we jacked up the, the barn was it was all bare studs. So we lag bolted, I think, two, two by 12s to the sides of the two by four studs and then used bottle jacks and, and jacked up the barn, got it level. Um, or jacked it up and then made the level foundation and then set it back down. Uh, so basically the, the framing and that part of the renovation took about three weeks because I only had Tom for three weeks. And once all the framing was done and we sheathed the roof, uh, Tom was done. He went back uh, to his regular job and then Matt was working for me and then we finished everything off with the insulation and um, sheetrock and things like that. I hired an electrician to put all the electric in. The downstairs is wired to have uh, 220. There is some bigger outlets because I was doing some welding in here originally. This first started out as a place to weld and I soon realized that I could make a lot more money uh, as a woodworker and an artist. Uh, the bulk of my income comes from making custom artwork and making custom frames. There's, making frames is a great way for, if you can get into the market, I do a lot of work in New York City, uh, if you can get into it because a frame doesn't have to function, it just has to be. Where with a cabinet, the doors have to work, the drawers have to work. So literally you're talking about four miters and the markup is really big. So um, it's a good business if you, can, if you can get it. And that's kind of, uh, the direction that my business went in because I was in the art business. I did own a brick and mortar gallery for 15 years from I think 1999 until 2015. 16 years maybe. So um, and I guess the whole renovation how long did it take? In all the whole renovation took probably uh, 
six months kind of on and off, you know, doing finish work, things like that, like trimming the windows and stuff, uh, because I wasn't constantly just working on the barn. Okay, so the second question is, what are the positives of having a workshop art studio separate from your house? And what are the drawbacks, if any? Uh, the positives are, it's great to get away from my family. I have four kids. I'm about 150 feet away from the house. Uh, I can make noise and it doesn't bother anybody. I can, um, it's just nice and it's a nice commute. You can't complain about that commute. And I think about that all the time because where I live here in New Jersey, most people are dealing with at least an hour or at least 45 minutes, I would say, each way. So you're talking about burning up probably two hours a day just for commuting. So I always like to think those are two hours of my day that are a gift and I can really uh, maximize my time with those. So if I get in the shop here at 7.30 in the morning, I'm already, I feel like I'm already ahead and I get up a lot earlier than that. Usually I start my mornings with editing. Uh, I do a little bit of editing, uh, I try to go on a run and then I get in the shop. My runs are like really slow. It's kind of like a fast walk and sometimes I run a little bit. Um, I'm not a hardcore runner. Uh, just trying to stay in shape. Uh, anyway, um, there's no drawbacks. It's great having the barn away from the house. And, and uh, I wish the barn was bigger. Every woodworker uh, always needs more space. Uh, the barn here is about 15 and a half feet wide and about 25 and a half feet on the inside of the shop. Then there's a little storage area that's about another six or seven feet. So the outside dimensions of the barn are about 16 by 32. The third question is, what organization systems do you have in place? This can be artwork, uh, your art studio, for example. How do you organize your tools? How do you organize your wood? How do you, or how do you organize your finished artwork? Okay, so I'm gonna get into the tools first, I try to have all of my tools inside a cabinet, except for this tool wall. This is kind of a nice little background, I think, for shooting video. Uh, but for the most part, I try to have all of my tools inside a cabinet, and that way uh, it keeps the dust down to a minimum. The way I clean the shop here is I'll do a sweep and get all the heavy stuff out, and then I like to turn on my exhaust fan, and I've got a, a little electric leaf blower and I'll put a mask on and I'll blow the walls and the cabinets and everything off. And because the tools are behind the cabinet doors, they don't collect as much dust. So uh, that's one way. Lumber, I try not to buy more lumber than I need because the one thing with lumber is it's just a shame to, I can't throw lumber out. I can burn it and I don't even like to do that. Uh, you know, when you get to these little pieces, but, um, the thing with lumber or even plywood, it just tends to get stacked up. So I try to uh, only buy what I need and just work for those projects or buy enough for those projects. Uh, when I was younger, I, I would see a really nice board and I would just buy it. And then that board would just sit on the lumber, uh, lumber rack for years, decades sometimes. So I no longer do that. Uh, as far as artwork, organizing your artwork. See, the thing with artwork is if you, look at, if you look at art history and you see like the pictures of Jackson Pollock standing in front of his paintings looking real cool, gigantic paintings, that's all really good if somebody's paying your bills. And that was the case with Jackson Pollock because Betty Parsons was paying his bills and so was uh, Peggy Guggenheim. That was all part of the... Uh, 1932, or, or I, I'm not sure when it started, but it was the Works Progress Association was started to uh, help pull the country out of the depression. And so artists were getting paid. And that's where really where abstract expressionist comes from because artists were leaving Europe to uh, escape uh, the war and they were coming over to the US. And at the same time, the US was relatively young. There was money in New York and uh, all these new artists were made. So we're talking Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, uh, Willem de Kooning. So anyway, all these guys are making these really big, cool paintings. That's great if, if you've got a place to put them and you've got somebody who's gonna buy them. Um, 
or if you've got the government paying for it, or, or in the case of Pollock, maybe Betty, Betty Parsons or Peggy Guggenheim. Um, but if you have to pay your own bills and you have to store your work and you have to figure out how you're going to get one painting from A to B, meaning your studio to a uh, collector's uh, wall, well, then you have to think about size. Um, I try not to make any paintings wider than uh, 48 inches because then I can get it inside my Honda Pilot. Uh, sometimes I will rent a van, but um, I used to have a big work van. I don't have one any longer. My, my work truck is my Honda Pilot, and I get uh, materials delivered. But anyway, um, so I think, it's, I think it's important for younger artists to be realistic about uh, their work and if they're going to be able to sell it, and if not, how they're going to store it, and how are they going to move it. So... I think it's good to try to find sizes that you're comfortable working in and um, try, to re try to stick to those sizes, you know, whether that's a standard um, 9 by 12, 9 by 12 inches, uh, or a um, 8 by 10s, or 24 by 24. But the, the thing about sticking with a size is then you can make a rack system, and that's what I do. So I have, I have basically boxes and the paintings I can store in those boxes and I'll use maybe um, three or four paintings and I can put a piece of cardboard in between each painting and that seems to work pretty well. I don't make that much big artwork any longer unless it's a commission. Uh, I'm frequently working on commissions what I do now is something I call digital installation, and that's because I've got a, uh, a pretty good following of art collectors. They know what I do, and they know that I'm willing to work with them and the, their designers. And so what happens is the collector will approach me with an idea, they'll come to the studio, we'll talk about it, and then I'll make what I call a study or a maquette and that might only be the size of this piece of paper or smaller and then I'll take a photograph of the study and then I'll take a photograph of the client's home or they'll send me one with their phone or they'll have a their designer send me one and then I'll digitally install the study which is like you know it's what the big painting is going to look like um, and I'll digitally install it in their home and make it look as if the painting is there. And you can do that all on Photoshop. So you can uh, show the light source, source, you can drop a shadow, you can uh, change the skew so the painting looks like it's already in the home. That's how I do all my commissions these days. And for the most part, I don't make big paintings unless it's a commission. That'll change one day when I'm older and I can just make art and I don't have to worry about paying for college and all the other stuff. But right now, you know, I gotta do what I gotta do. So anyway, um, I feel like I got a little sidetracked there, but basically what I do now is I, ma I mainly make small paintings. That's just to satisfy my desire to make some kind of artwork. And then I make studies for bigger paintings. Uh, I work in everything from painting on aluminum to steel to working with encaustic, which is a combination of beeswax and DeMar crystals and pigments. Um, oil paintings, landscape paintings, uh, it pretty much runs the gamut. I never say no to a commission. When a client talks to me about uh, an idea that they're having or uh, that they're, if they're a designer and the client has an idea, I always just say, sure, I can do that. Even if it sounds really weird or it sounds like something I, I don't want to or can't do, I just say sure because so far, every time, two or three days later, an idea comes to me and, and it just makes sense. And uh, then I go back to the client with a little study and, and it all works out. So never say no to a project. You can always, it's easy to say no, but if you say yes, then you have to start thinking, you have to start working. So never say no. And if you get to a point where you thought about it and thought, geez, I don't want to do that, or it's uh, something I can't do, well, then you say no, but don't say no right away. What are your future plans for the barn? Well, um, I just added a little shed for my dust collection. That's something relatively new. I'm really happy to have dust collection finally in the shop here. 
it's uh, it's not quite finished yet, but it the the bulk of the work is done. Uh, other than that, I might one day expand the barn on the south side. There's a shed on the wall behind the camera, and it, the shed needs some work. And um, but it's a pretty good sized shed, so I might expand into that shed, and that would give me a little bit more storage space. Maybe I could even expand the shed forward and make a little finishing room there. I there's I don't know when I'm going to do that, but that's definitely something I would like to do. I basically, um, the barn's a great barn. Don't get me wrong, a lot of people would love to have a space like this. But it is small. For the amount of projects that I make, it is small. Especially when you start working on a big project, like when I built the storage bed this spring. It, a big project like that just takes over a, a space this small. So ultimately, there's no real uh, plans to change this barn in any dramatic way. Uh, but one day I would like to move the shop into a bigger barn. Now, whether that means I leave New Jersey, um, I do have land up in Vermont. I've talked about this on my show. A couple of years ago, I bought uh, an old farmhouse with 110 acres. We kept the house. I, I kind of thought we were going to move up there. It's kind of a long story. But anyway, we kept the house and we would go there often. My wife's originally from Vermont. The house was right up the road from where her grandmother lived until she passed away. But eventually, the kids really didn't want to go drive six hours to go up to the house in Vermont anymore. They kind of, you know, they had their lives here. They've got their sports here. So when the house became a place that uh, we had to go to, as opposed to a place we wanted to go to, we put it on the market and it took about two years to sell the house. Uh, but we sold the house maybe two years ago and I kept 20 acres, so I've got a 20 acre building lot up there. And maybe I'll build a nice big barn up there and, and uh, maybe even a nice little house. Um, I would like to do that because as a woodworker, there's just never enough space. That's just always how it is uh, when you're buying lumber and you've got machines. Like I know a lot of guys have CNC machines. I wouldn't know where to put a CNC machine in, in this place. Um, so, uh, in short, I don't see myself doing too much to this barn other than maintaining it and some work around the, the property, um, but uh, I don't really see changing the size too much. So anyway, I guess that is about it. Uh, I really enjoyed this, Courtney, so uh, thanks. Definitely check out Greywood Mama. I'll have a link in the description. And um, as always, guys, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you soon.